All right, everybody. Thanks once again for joining us today for Key Digital Webinar Series, sponsored by Capital Sales. We're sure glad to have you today, and we're sure glad that you've given us the opportunity to tell you about our control system here at Key Digital, Compass Control. Compass Control's been out for two years now, and if you've been observing it from the outside, perhaps, you're going to see that for a two-year-old product, we have a very mature product. You're going to see that it's everything that Key Digital always delivers, quality, performance, reliability. In the control side, of course, Key Digital is a 15-year-old company. So for those of you who may be hearing of our company for the first time, Key Digital is a 15-year-old company. And we like to think of ourselves as a resource to you. We come from the video distribution side of our industry, in the audio video. Distributed video is where we have had our bread and butter, or where we have buttered our bread over the past 15 years. And we've separated ourselves from our competition, staying on the bleeding edge of technology, and all the while offering the highest quality, performance, and reliability in our products because of this gentleman here, Mike Sinberg, our owner and chief engineer. He's not just the owner. He creates all of the parts here at Key Digital. He has his hands on everything here at Key Digital. But if you Google his name, you might find that he is also the father of DVD. He is also the one and only engineer listed on the patent for the ATSC signal. That was High definition, that was back in 1983, believe it or not, for Philips Corporation. And those are just two of his 40 video patents under his belt. Before he started Key Digital 15 years ago to offer full circle video system solutions and more. Now, at Key Digital, we've analyzed the past five years of our return numbers. And again, we've always made our products emphasizing quality, performance, and reliability. So when we analyzed those numbers, we were very easily able to recognize that we could offer something that nobody else in the industry does. That would be a lifetime warranty on all of our products purchased after January 1st, 2014. And if you've used our products, you know we're a company whose reputation carries us a long way. Reputation for a reliable product, a reputation for a product that demystifies HDMI, making it easy for you to do advanced things with HDMI. And this lifetime warranty takes it to the next step here. It's going to offer confidence from us to capital sales, from capital sales to you, and from you to your end user. You better believe that when they see one of their proposals is backed by a lifetime warranty for the video matrixing and control hardware, that is going to affect their decision making. So keep that in mind. Anything purchased after January 1st, 2014 is backed by Key Digital's lifetime warranty. And just one final note, if you're going to be going to Denver two weeks from now, can't believe it. It's already here upon us. Cedia Expo Denver will be there too. We'll be at booth 420 in Denver, Colorado. Enough said about that. Come on through. We also have two training opportunities, one of which is a full day course on compass control. The other, HDMI, HD based T switching and connectivity challenges presented by the Mike Sinberg I just introduced you to. You could go to our website to find information about these events under the PR Newsroom section of our website. You have upcoming events. Make a little note on your piece of paper, but please don't leave this presentation now to go do that. We'd like you to sit tight, pay attention as we begin Compass Control System, the modern system app, the modern control system, the IP-based control system for modern system integration. How's that? <clears throat> now, two years now, Key Digital has been selling Compass Control. Two years ago, Compass Control was brought to the market. It's been a very nice time for us since then. It's introduced Q 
key digital products into systems that we've never been involved in in the past and really broadened our horizons. It's made us a more important vendor to you and to your colleagues in the industry than ever before. It's made us more of a service provider, a support provider. And that's a good thing to be a support provider because the fly-by-nights and the folks who just sell other people's products with their silk screen and paint job on it, they don't, they're not there to offer support. All they can do is move boxes. Now, two years ago, we came out with Compass Control, and that was a very beneficial time. We already knew at that point everything had to be on the network. IP is the way things are going. It is the standard. It's at every job site, isn't it? And we knew one other thing that Compass Control has certainly embodied. It's not about, for your end user, it's not about putting the control system on this brand or that brand's touch screen any longer. It is, can you put the, the control system into my tablet? Getting away from brand specific and going to tablet based. And that's what control, that's what compass control has embodied. And that's what we saw coming. And that was the surfboard for the tsunami for key digital iOS. So for two years, compass control was strictly iOS based. That's iPad of all sizes, iPod Touch, and iPhone. And here at Cedia, again, just two weeks from now, we will be officially launching the handheld remote of the Compass Control System, KDZRC300. Now, there's a few differences when you're using iOS and when you're using the handheld remote in the system because we're not only an app, you see, with Compass Control. Key Digital realized just how powerful these iPads are. And every Mac user, in fact, realizes just how powerful the processing is in Mac and Apple devices. We enabled each and every iOS device in the system to be like its own master controller, believe it or not. We, all of the intelligence live in the iPad. It's not an app that, ha that relies upon conversion at the master controller from the other control systems to receive information, convert information. That all takes time. Everything lives in the iPad when you have your compass control system loaded into the iPad. And because it's all IP based, you're never going to have a master slave type scenario with your master controllers. Okay? Never have a master slave. Instead, they are just different IP addresses. We take a look at this system here and Let's grab the highlighter. Now, in your Compass Navigator software, you will add a master controller, and you a property of that master controller is simply the local IP address of the master controller. And so in this simple system here where I press a button and perhaps it is to control a device A through D, this information loads into the iPad so that if the iPad knows it's controlling device A through D, it knows it's connected to master controller number one, and that is this IP address. If I'm controlling device E through H, well then, those are connected to master controller number two, which has its own unique IP address, and it knows the connectivity because of this control connectivity tree. Um, now, <coughs> So this is very nice, and what this means is that there's really no limit to how many master controllers you could have in a system. Because as long as you have an available IP address, you can continue to add master controllers. And so that makes 253 IP addresses available. Of course, you're going to have an iPad, right? And from what I'm told, maybe a little over my knowledge level and pay scale, um, you could open up different subnet masks or open up and, and, and to create new, uh, additional IP addresses. So it's essentially an infinite amount of master controllers that are possible. And our KDMC 1000, which I will introduce you to further, 
is designed like a Swiss Army knife. So if you have an application that could use five master controllers, one in each room, then great. They're going to live on that same network if you'd like. Perhaps you have a facilities manager who would like to control each of those rooms from their own iPad where the other iPads in the system maybe only have access to their, their respective room. Not a problem. They're all on the network. And where we have local IP, we also have support for global IP so that if this is a home or a business, they can control New York from Minneapolis or monitor status of Minneapolis from, from New York in any combination. Now, we had a great question come up. That question is, are there any plans for Droid support? Well, again, Compass Control is all iOS at this time. And although we're not opposed to that, we have no immediate timeline for Droid support. So as of this time, it is strictly iOS. Good question. So we'll take a look at the next slide here, sticking with what it means exactly to be an IP-based control system. <clears throat> Your controllers themselves, the iPads, iOS devices, have can be assigned their own IP address. So it can be DHCP if there's no need for bidirectional feedback. However, you could enter the IP address of the master controllers and your iPads can exchange information. When they exchange information, you'll, it's essentially a new type of bidirectional communication that happens immediately over the network. How does traditional bidirectional information uh, work? Uh, bidirectional uh, information, you would set some level on a amplifier, for example, from the master controller. That, that amplifier, the, uh, the bidirectional driver would have some delay. The amplifier would respond saying, yes, now you have set the volume in zone X to level Y. You know, zone 5 volume equals 60. That all takes time to set, get, and then the MC, the master controller would have to update all of its connected controllers so that they can receive that information and graphical events can occur. Now, what if I told you that one user can control a volume slider and if you have that other iPad right beside it instantaneously that second iPad's volume slider will move with it in sync. How does it happen so fast? Via network. So the bidirectional feedback now is not only possible from the master controller to the controllers but also controller to controller communication is possible because of this new type of bidirectional feedback we enable. It's very cool and we have some very nice demo videos of that that the folks at Capital Sales should have now where we uh, demonstrate the Compass Control System interfacing with the DBX Zone Pro which has been a very popular uh, system for bar and restaurant applications especially I know and you see the volume control sliders just dancing together one to the other, one controls the other. And that's because we support variables at Compass Control. And not only do we support variables like integer value, string value, decimal value, Boolean true or false, but you can specify that a value of any variable should be shared. And when a var variable's value is shared, then they're able, uh, then you could have an event on them that says, okay, well, whatever this variable equals is going to be in charge of a certain graphical element. For example, a variable called volume zone 5 should be in charge of a of the slider that is the volume zone 5 slider. The value should be equal. So it's uh, it's pretty pretty neat how that happens and again without trying to play a video through webinar which would just be very lame and very ugly, I invite you to reach out to me at my contact info will be here or the folks at Capital Sales who should all have that nice DBX Zone Pro video with Compass Control. And just like before, because your iPads are IP addresses, the amount of controllers you could have, your iOS devices, is essentially limitless as well. 
Now, of course, to you, you want to make sure that we are working with the parts that you work with. And we, for that, we have our Compass Alliance partners. These are the best folks at what they do in our industry. These are the folks that our partners, like Capital Sales, have asked us to ensure that we are fully integratable with. Bidirectional drivers are created where possible. Now, this list here uh, is viewable under the Partners section of Key Digital's web page. However, it doesn't necessarily reflect the entire list, of course, of the bidirectional control drivers that we have. So if you don't see something in the Partners, you could go to the Compass Control section, Bidirectional Control Drivers, to see more. And we understand one thing here at Key Digital. Folks don't like to be told what they have to buy. So we're here to partner with the best people at what they do in the industry. And we also understand one more thing. Sometimes you just don't want to program things twice, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you could program your Lutron system, import that XML report, and have it automatically populate all necessary codes, variables, logic, and, of course, graphics? The answer is yes. And we do that with some of those very ex extensive, expansive automation systems that are out there. Honeywell, HAI Leviton, and Lutron. Now, how do you begin selling compass control? There's three levels of certification. Level one is needed to become a dealer. Level C1. And in fact, you guys are jumping in at a great time here because we're going to have new C1 videos posted online next week in time for the launch of these new products at Cedia. So we'll make sure that the folks at Capital get that information to let you know that the new training videos are fully available. A lot of it will actually be just like what you see here today, a system introduction, but then also a very introductory way of programming systems that I'll introduce you to here shortly. We're not going to show programming, but I'll introduce you to those methods. Now, there's three levels of training. C1 is a overview and an introductory way of programming, as I mentioned, for single zone applications. C2 is in the case that your client has a brand new product, the latest, the greatest, and perhaps Key Digital does not yet have the IR, RS-232, or TCP IP control codes for that device. Does that mean you can't use it? Of course not. In the C2 trainings, we teach you how to create any control codes, learning remotes, importing pronto hex files, et cetera, et cetera, for IR, creating RS-232, creating TCP IP commands, no problem. C3 is if you'd like to really capitalize on what Key Digital offers with our Compass Control System, where we Enable that iPad to be a blank palette for your creation. C3 is we teach you how to do that. What are the graphical elements we give you? How do you manipulate them? What are the tools for doing that? Or the events and actions as we call them. C3 certification is only obtained by submitting your C3 level project where C1 and C2 are multiple choice exams. You can get these two ways, in-house or online. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Now, when you're C3 certified, there's going to be some big benefits. So, you know, C1 actually enables you to sell this in the, in the bulk quantity of installation types. C1 enables, uh, will teach you how to program single zone systems, home theater systems on the Zigbee remote, uh, our ZRC300, uh, or in the iPad, or and in the iPad and a nice fixed look and feel. But that C3, again, is that full blank palette iPad, knowing how to do that. And when you're C3 certified, we allow you then to download all of our bidirectional control drivers free of charge. We also allow you to download pre-built templates. These are working projects that we've obtained from our partners, our dealers in the field that we like them so much that we offer parts for them or whatever kind of services we can to obtain that so that you guys who say, wow, Compass is great, it's a blank palette, this and that, maybe your first job is happening two weeks from now, not 
three, not, not a, uh, you know, not a month from now or so or, or whatnot, you might want something that's pre-built to start with, won't you? And so if you are C3 certified, those C3 credentials allow you to download these templates and our bi-directional control drivers free of charge because then we know it's not just going to be creating a, uh, a tech support call, if you will, and everybody's going to be well informed. So if you'd like to begin with your online training, you just go to keydigital.com, go to that login. Again, those C1 videos are going to be updated, new content next week. They'll be posted. Go to the login at the top right corner, click here to sign up and submit your information. Or if you'd like to check out coming to New York, where we have a very nice program, all you got to do is get here. We're going to cover the hotel, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Typically, they're three-day courses, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so that you're able to, if you wish, stay an extra day or two and go into Manhattan, where we're located just north of New York City here at Key Digital. You're able to do that. Of course, the hotels are on you at that point, but it's really very unique in our industry that a company provides so much and gives so much because it's an investment for us as well. Just like you're investing yourself, your time, your money into learning this new control system, it's also an investment for Key Digital, and we find that that's the best way to do business. Our software, Compass Control Software, is free of charge with your C1 certification. Well, in fact, next week you, you'll be able to download our software free of charge even without C1 certification because the Zigbee remote, the ZRC300, the handheld remote, won't require C1 certification because you don't have to even watch training videos. We've put together documentation that make, should make this very, very easy to do. So you can download our software free of charge. The Compass Control Software Suite contains five components. Compass Navigator is the main component of the Compass Control Software Suite. Compass Navigator is where you build projects. I have this project where I have these devices in it. Here's how I want to, uh, here's where I want them to be connected to as far as from my master controller so that if I control the Blu-ray player, it executes the IR commands out of this port. And then building your GUI. Now the other four components are what we call the managers. These are the items we teach you, we walk you through in C2. Starting with the master controller manager where basically when you go out of the box, you got to do two things to your master controller. You need to make sure you got the latest firmware on it and setting the IP address. The other three managers are your library, your code set library managers, where you could view our IR, RS-232, or TCP IP codes, manipulate our codes, create your own codes. Again, like I mentioned earlier, if you don't see a device listed in Key Digital's library, that does not mean that you cannot use that device. You might just have to create those codes. Now I'll have you know, because many people ask about our IR library, we use the same library that some of those other control systems have been using for years now. There's a third-party provider. We're using that provider as well. So you'll find our IR library to be very familiar if you're working with that. I can't really name names here, but if you're working with the with some of those other control systems, we have that same IR library that the other guys are using. Compass Navigator. Now, what can we say about Compass Navigator? I'll tell you, I'll tell you something about this. I'll tell you what brings people to Compass Control. I am our training manager. I often travel around the country, around the world, um, training on Compass Control or folks come to New York and we're happy to have them. Um, a lot of guys have worked with other systems before, and especially the guys who work with those home systems. They say, they usually have the same thing to say. They say, you know, I have this vision of what I'm going to deliver for my client's system. And when I am programming that system with these other control systems, 
their software has me reaching limitations that prevent me from delivering that vision that I have. In Compass Control, we don't present any limitations. No limitations. Fully flexible. You can create the logic, etc., etc., etc. Now that's with your custom systems, your C3 type systems. If you'd like a quick get in, get out, pre-built GUI for a single zone home theater conference room, we have that as well. I'll show you in just a moment. Now for those guys who say, well, okay, so if you're doing the stuff that some of the big boys are doing with full logic creation and that sort of thing, how does that look? Well, it's not in C coding. Instead, those tools, those events and actions, the best way to describe those, what they do, is basically they write the C code for you. If you're going to have a graphical event, for example, you just tell us what graphic it is and how you want to manipulate it through drop-down menus, not from writing an entire line of coding. It's like the code is written and there's some parameters, some empty spaces in that code that you'll fill in the blanks for and we, Compass Navigator, take care of the rest. So I've mentioned now the two types of projects. One, the custom project, and secondly, a module-based project. Now, both of these product, projects, excuse me, custom and module-based, enable to use not only the iOS device, but also the handheld remote. The custom project is, again, the iPad being a blank palette. You're building that GUI from scratch, okay? A modular-based project has predefined modules. Those modules are created by key digital software engineers and are fully verified here. I'll show you what they look like in a moment. When you program a modular-based system, you will have to create a zone connectivity tree. The television has an HDMI cable that's connected to an AV receiver. Feeding into the AV receiver, an Apple TV, a satellite box, a Blu-ray player, and why do we make you build that? So that if you press the button that says, let's watch the Blu-ray player, that those, that selection macro is automatically programmed in this modular-based project. Now these modules are going to be not only available from Key Digital, but we're also in the future going to have a marketplace where these modules can be exchanged. Here's what the modules look like currently, the ones that are created, provided by Key Digital. It's that traditional navigation where you choose your activity, you choose your device, and the rest of the real estate of the iPad essentially is dedicated to the control panel for that device. Now what's important to know is this, the modular project, we really are marketing it as a single zone, fixed solution, not much customization possible. However, you really can edit that actually. You can actually bring in, you could edit modules, you could put modules into a custom project and, um, and these sorts of things. But really that's, you know, you're still going to want to have the C3 knowledge when you start doing that sort of stuff. It'll save you a lot of time rather than building everything from scratch. But, uh, but, but the modular based project is really being marketed as a single zone solution with the pre-built look and feel because we know that this for you guys and for us and for capital sales as well is a low hanging fruit. These are the jobs that are more common than the multi-zone distributed video jobs, right? Distributed audio jobs, a single zone. Let's start in the home theater or media room for example. And this is a perfect fit for that in this modular system. Now what is a module? It's important to establish that terminology. A module is not just a code set, a library of codes to control a device. We call that a library. A module is the graphical interface, the, the, uh, the library, which is the one-way control codes, or even a driver, which means there's going to be bidirectional sets and gets. There's going to be variables that compile into the project as a result of having that bidirectional added in. So you drop in that module and you're dropping all of these things right into the system making it extremely convenient. Let's see here. 
Okay, we have a question. Okay, it looks like the question, let me just uh, take a step back on the slide. Looks like a good one. Let me make sure I understand it correctly, though. The question says, can you drag and drop within the interface? Can you also slide the device list to reveal more devices, etc.? Well, that device list, yeah, it looks like our, uh, our, our device uh, column there, the second to the left. That actually, it's, it's interesting that you use the terminology list, because that is ex exactly what we call that graphical element of ours. A list is the type of graphical element that we allow you to, um, to, to use that swipe gesture, uh, either vertically or horizontally, to control that, okay? So yeah, that, uh, that uh, device list can be, uh, is, is uh, just that, a list element. So if it goes beyond that, uh, that border or that, um, that uh, dimensions, excuse me, that we have there, um, then absolutely you could reveal more. You could even press an, a button that allows or that would jump right to the second set of devices, for example. That would be a graphical um, event. You press a button and it goes through, you know, 1 through 8, 9 through 16, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, the other question, drag and drop within the interface. Now, that one, um, that's not really something that's, uh, that's uh, you know, like I, I imagine what you're asking here is kind of, you know, you take a source and you slide it over to where you want to view it or something. And, and, uh, and that's not really something that's supported in there, uh, in our software. Um, it's kind of a cool idea, I suppose. Uh, but, uh, we, you know, you could essentially emulate that kind of gesture by, uh, or, but it wouldn't drag the shape with it, if that's what uh, I understand your question to read. Um, drag and drop. The matrix where there are multiple others. Yeah, okay, so I think I do understand your question. So he's clarified here. And, and these are great questions, guys. I appreciate them because you're probably not the only one thinking these things. So regarding the drag and drop, say, for example, the, the example is a matrix where there are multiple monitors and multiple inputs. Can I drag and drop the input to the monitor? No, again, the, sh the, the shape wouldn't move with it, in other words, but there are, you could kind of emulate that. I'll show you some custom GUIs at the end of the presentation here where you could kind of see uh, perhaps... Uh, how, uh, uh, what different ways you could have the, uh, the, the whole system uh, dance with uh, for you there. Good questions, though. And speaking of uh, GUIs here, uh, this is a great one because this really is packed full of the different types of graphical interfaces. This is the Compass Control app, which is free of charge. Just go to the App Store and search Compass Control. Now this is the main, our flagship demo that we've had for the two years. Many of you guys have seen this before through our advertising and, and uh, at our trade show booths, etc. Um, some people say it looks a little, uh, a little busy, and I agree. But the point of it is actually to, to showcase everything that we offer, the graphic-wise, we put web apps in there so you could actually embed the internet into Compass Control so you don't even have to leave the app in order to, uh, to be browsing the internet or to, be, to have a specific web page pull up. A lot of folks use RoomWizard software at the conference room where they could, you know, through the internet or through intranet, uh, book the conference room for their next meeting, that sort of thing. Um, so this is the one that will load by default. Now, However, this, this, is, this is, a lot of people ask, what's the, way to, what's the best sales tool? This is the best sales tool because you'll also find when you download this software uh, or this app into your iOS device on the iPads anyhow, there's actually 12 different GUIs available, six different residential, six different commercial that will have uh, you, um, you know, that will be, have you set up if you have proposal in the morning for a residential client and, uh, and a school in the afternoon or a conference room. We have many different looks and feels in there because again, these are a lot of the, um, a lot of the really cool custom GUIs that we go ahead and acquire from some of our integrators. Now, when you download our app, okay, so you've now, you now know to download the Compass Control app from the App Store. When you download our app, there's going to be a really important thing uh, that 
actually you don't have you won't have it as a demo it's fine you don't need it but if you'd like to take the next step to make your iPad a live controller to do programming there is a device ID that must be manually generated and it happens very easily you just get on this uh, your PC and the iPad on the same network so yes you need to have all your iPads with you just for this one step um, you will uh, uh, you will have the two devices on the same network the computer the PC running compass control software and the iPad and there's a button as you see right here it says ID generator and it allows you to you press that and it'll pop up a key that you'll type that information in on the iPad and it will automatically populate this device ID and that's the one and only time you ever need to do it the device ID is a unique identifier for each iOS device why because each iOS device will be activated by marrying it with one of our licenses KD CSL XY compass software license for one iPad so this gets married to each device okay so in your job if you're gonna have five iOS devices you will require quantity five of these CSL X ones they marry to each device because remember in compass each iPad is its own master controller and they could be unique graphically programming wise they could be 100 percent unique and we also have to activate each license so that you the installer could make money on each iPad in the system again for two years compass control was strictly iOS how were you able to make money on that was through our licensing structure now there's actually one more reason that the compass uh, uh, the I iOS devices need to be licensed activated through the license because it you've also now purchased a little chunk of real estate in the key digital cloud now that chunk of real estate is not you personally having your own folder but it is your company having a folder in which each C1 certified programmer within your company uh, we check the email domain and the company name when they register your programmers if you're an organization organization with multiple programmers your programmers can all be posting to and taking from one folder and we do that for a few reasons first of all iPad iOS doesn't like you to connect a wire and load things into the iOS device correct so that's why we had to go to this cloud system and it's actually served a big benefit um, I the programmer can be in New York program my compass control system I need to know that device ID number and that and that device ID needs to be ha have been activated and I press this update project button and it begins posting that project up to the cloud for each and every I, uh, device ID iPad that has been posted in the project it goes up to the cloud and on the iPad maybe you in Minneapolis or in New York doesn't matter um, we'll press this update project button which pulls the project from the cloud for that device ID into the iPad so that activation license is like the key isn't it uh, you enter that device ID when you post something to the cloud we check that number is that device ID activated yet or not if it is that project can post to the cloud if it's not activated yet it doesn't get to go to the cloud similarly when you're on that device ID on that iPad and I hit update project it's going to go to the cloud it pings our cloud and it will say hey I'm a 7900 etc cetera, etc cetera, as you see here what is the most recent project loaded to the cloud for me to pull down so it is the most recently time stepped program project for that iPad for example me Jonathan my iPad probably has had 400 different projects loaded in it by now maybe more 400 I am probably the number one space consumer in the key digital cloud and I've only had to activate my license or my iPad with one license because it is per iPad not per project per iPad now this cloud serves as a pretty cool benefit for you the installer I kind of touch lightly on it you can program re remotely and 
Uh, or you could even pull down remotely. So uh, you can actually download from our cloud. Because actually, in fact, uh, let's paint the picture here. Mr. Client gives you a call and says, hey, um, uh, you know, the system is in. And, uh, you know, a week ago, a Blu-ray player took a dive on me. I went out and bought a new Blu-ray player. However, uh, the video codes work, or the video is working on the TVs, obviously, but the control codes are not working. Well, you do some digging and you find they, you know, originally had a Samsung Blu-ray player. They installed a Pioneer Blu-ray player, which obviously isn't going to work with the control codes. You could actually, uh, even if you yourself don't have that project on your computer, maybe one of your other programmers did this, uh, this project, and maybe that programmer's on vacation. You could say, okay, Mr. Customer, well, um, you know, that programmer's away on vacation. Um, so either we could wait for them to get back, or if you're comfortable pressing this settings button here, there's a, another button within that. If you guys have your iPads with our app loaded already, please take a look. Settings and then about, and you can see that project name. And if you know that project name, you're able to pull that down from our cloud, from your cloud, from your folder, because you have access to that same folder that the programmer, the other programmers within your organization have access to. So then you could say, okay, Mr. Customer, give me 20, 30 minutes here. We'll fix that right up. And then you could give them a call and say, okay, Mr. Customer, pro the project is updated. Please go ahead and press update project here. And the newest project will, will be loaded in with those correct control codes. And this has been a big, big benefit to us, actually. Uh, you don't have to, you, you get to make your customer happy. You don't have to charge for parking. You just send the invoice, of course, for your programming time, right? We always make sure we do that. Okay, so we have a, uh, two questions here. Uh, number one, are licenses transferable? if an end user upgrades their iPad? That's a great question. Great, great question. The answer is, yeah, it's absolutely transferable, okay? Um, it's not a reoccurring monthly revenue. It's not a reoccurring yearly revenue, unless you want it to be, <laughs> in which case we won't say anything differently. Um, that license number, so say they upgrade their iPad, um, all you have to do is let us know the new device ID number and the original license number or and the license number the license and the new device ID number what we do is we divorce that old uh, relationship between license and device ID and we make the marriage of the new relationship with the license and the new device ID which looks like uh, maybe leading leading us into the second question here which is what happens when the end user upgrades the iPad or breaks or changes the iPad does the installer have to go on site to ge generate another device ID? Well, yes, as I mentioned before, that is one part that the, 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 a, a PC running our software needs to be on the same network with the iPad that is going to be creating that device ID in it. So it's a good question, and and it's unfortunate that it, that that did uh, that that's necessary. I mean, uh, it would be really nice if we could do everything without rolling out the van, right? It's unfortunate, but that's that is what happened. Unfortunately, uh, it, uh, initially the device ID was always created in the iPad. Once you downloaded our app, you had a device ID in there. However, once iOS seven came along, there was some kind of information that. Uh, Apple decided to block from apps accessing, and uh, and so we, as a result, we're no longer able to automatically create that device ID. It has to be done manually. Okay, so you know if the customer needs to upgrade their iPad or whatever, maybe uh, you, uh, either a you have to roll out the van, or you have them send it to you, or maybe you purchase the iPad, have the device ID, do the license activation and uploading and send it their way. Good questions, though, guys, and those are absolutely uh, very, very relevant questions to how the system works. Good. Keep them coming if you have any more questions. So now let's talk about the hardware of the system. Well, we start with KDMC 1000, which is the the, the primary master controller of the Compass Control System now. 
okay? It is actually a bit like a Swiss Army knife. Like I mentioned before, that kind of sample application uh, that we're involved in where maybe you have a corporate installation or a residential installation and maybe uh, you're going to have five rooms with five master controllers in, or, or one master controller in each room. This is rather small. It's built to be more of a shelf-mounted product because of that other core application, that single zone application that we discussed. Okay, um, <clears throat> It's rather small, uh, very lightweight. Um, we built it this way so that you could have one in each room. Or because of the IP ability, you could just have, you could, if you need to have five rooms, you could stack five in, the, in a single rack if you'd like. They just need their own different IP address. So this is a very flexible device where on the front of the unit, you have an IR learning port. That's a very important feature, of course, because you never know if you're going to run into a, a, a brand new device in an installation you might need to learn IR codes for from the remote. So for you, I do recommend always bringing in one of these MC1000s as your own for your company here for that IR learning ability as well as just getting your hands dirty with the system. On the front, you also have these six LED lights which correspond respectively to our MCP35 ports. MCP35, multifunction compass port, 3.5 millimeter. So one to one, two to two, all the way to six to six. And those LED lights are quite helpful in troubleshooting because they are activated by the voltage passing through the port, the respective port. So it's a nice troubleshooting device if you say, hey, I pressed the button and the TV's not turning on. Well, one thing that I'll have you look at if you can't, if you don't have, for example, a blinking IR emitter, is I'll have you check out the LED light on the front of the unit. And is it blinking? Is it in? Uh, is it blinking when you press that button? Then, if so, then actually something is being executed, and then we take it the, sh the troubleshooting from there. You have your USB on the front of the unit. Now your six MCP thirty fives. We call it MCP thirty five again. Multifunction compass port, three point five millimeter. We call it three uh, that uh, MCP thirty five because in the future we'll have MCP forty five ports as well on RJ forty fives. But that'll be on an entirely different product that is uh, not in the two uh, or not not any time too soon going to be released. Um, Multifunction compass ports can be either IR. Bidirectional RS-232, a voltage sensor, or a voltage trigger. So they're very multifunctional, as the name implies. You have a dedicated relay for normally open or normally closed settings. You have a Zigbee port here. This 3.5 millimeter is actually a three-ring, four-conductor port. Transmit, receive, and ground, and power as well for the Zigbee receiver antenna that I'll introduce you to in a moment. But if you're not going to be using our handheld remote, that port can even be used as an RS-232, and we include the special uh, three-ring, four-conductor to DB9 cable in the package with this MC-1000. And then your network port. That network port just connects to the router of the system, either your network switch or Wi-Fi router, right? Because, remember, everything lives in the iOS device, including the IP control code. So if you press a button on an iPad, and that's, that's going to control an IP controllable device. In fact, the iPad communicates directly to that device via the network. The MC has nothing to do with it. Or if you're going to be controlling an IP controllable device off of our Zigbee remote control, then the MC1000 actually, in that case, will execute the IP control codes and it just executes out of that port and again goes through your network switch. So the KDZRC300 here, oh you know it looks like we have a question, one moment. Okay, so we have two questions here. Some, uh, one, one question is asking about um, 
if a, uh, a third party manufacturer has, um, you know, a module available for, a, uh, for a, a, another a fourth party, a th another third party control system, are those able to be imported in a compass control? Well, the answer is going to be no there. Okay, so, um, so if you're, if you've got, you know, some bidirectional control module for, uh, or driver for, you know, one of our, a, a competitor's control system, that thing most likely can't, or 100% can't just be dropped into compass control. Now, with that being said, we actually do enable you to write your own bidirectional drivers. That does, that is the one and only part of compass control, though, that would require you understand, uh, basic C. It's, it's just like basic C, except for, uh, there's a few little tweaks to it. We'll get you in touch with the appropriate person here at our uh, company. And we also do write drivers. We just need a piece of hardware and appropriate time based on your project, of course. We need appropriate lead time. Um, now, to make sure, though, that I'm not just completely saying uh, or answering that question wrong, if you have, you know, if you're controlling a third-party amplifier, the, the specific... Uh, device here uh, mentioned in the question is lab groupin uh, I think I'm pronouncing that right um, if you if you you know research and find their RS232 protocol documents you can create a one-way code set to control that device that's not a problem you do that in the RS232 manager which is something that will teach you in C2 online training videos and then you could create those codes. And remember, you could even kind of create that fake two-way by going iPad to iPad that will have the system statuses always correct, you know, for the volume in each zone and selected source in each zone or whatever kind of variables you'd like to set to be global as long as the device or those values are set from an iPad. Um, another question, uh, do I know if power is applied to the MCP ports during power-up? Um, good question. Uh, I would say that the answer is no. I'm not 100% sure about that. So I have your email address here and I could get that answer to you. But uh, I, I'm not sure exactly why that would be needed. Maybe some devices uh, would activate or something based on uh, some voltage being present all of a sudden. Um, so uh, during power up, do you know if, it, if power is applied to the MCP ports during power up? trying to think, uh, make sure that I'm not uh, overlooking the question here. Um, you know, the, uh, I mean, first of all, a control system, a master controller is something that's uh, typically always going to remain on, actually. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it might be difficult to turn on the system. Um, so, uh, but if you'd like, for example, to turn on one device and have it execute voltage to another device, that's, uh, that can be easily programmed onto the button. And then finally, uh, can you view cameras through the system? Uh, the answer to that is yes. You can view cameras. It's just like embedding the web into the compass control. However, very important to know that not all formats of uh, streaming uh, video are supported. For example, I can tell you uh, the RTSP, real-time streaming player format, is probably the most common format for the video streaming from uh, IP cameras, for example. It's probably the most common format. And unfortunately, right now, that is not a format that we support. We support HTTP, though, which is a, also a relatively common uh, format. And it's also the most common format from the DVR or NVR. Um, so if the device is connected through that NVR, then that NVR typically outputs it, or streams the video in HTTP format. Um, and then another question. Um, can I ask the differences between you and Savant? Um, well, it's a very good question because both, uh, you know, there's many uh, similarities between our system 
and their system because uh, they were uh, an early embracer of the iOS as the uh, as the control interface, uh, as are we. And I would say that the biggest difference, well, outside of price, <laughs> typically we're coming in, um, you know, without knowing uh, any third-party uh, prices. Um, I would, there have been many instances in which our system uh, control plus video hardware, if if video hardware is is necessary, and it's not mandatory in a compass system. Um, compared to theirs, and theirs could mean not only uh, the aforementioned brand, but even some other of the uh, brands that are known to be more expensive in the industry, the Control Plus hardware brands. Uh, in many cases, we're coming in at 75% less. 75% less. So if their system is $1,000, our system is $250. That, uh, it's not always going to be the case, but in many cases, we've come in at that much less. And so, you know, for when people ask to compare and contrast with other systems, you know, our typical, our typical take on things is, you know, look, people want to do different types of systems, and sometimes companies are very successful by offering one manufacturer, one system at a certain price point, and another system at a other price point, and we have been a very nice complement to some of those very expensive third-party control systems that that are uh, that you know those don't those kind of budgets aren't every single job. Here we enable you to to reach every single job uh, or more of the jobs with our price points. But uh, technically speaking, um, one huge advantage or one huge difference is again we use a we enable each iOS device to be its own master controller, right? The all of the intelligence, all of the processing happens in that in that iOS device. It makes it extremely fast. I've seen some of these third-party control systems who have their own iOS app, and going from page one to page two is more like browsing the internet because the web page has, or the, each page has to load like loading a web browser. You don't get that in Compass Control. It all lives in the app, and uh, and and you don't need a master controller. Uh, or you know, I think those other guys use a uh, Mac Mini as a master controller, which is not uh, something we do. Our uh, our master controller is more of an IP relay box, so that reduces the cost. And then finally, uh, a very important thing that I actually have not mentioned yet. Um, I've, I've, I've said the words PC many, many times. Programming in a PC, programming in a PC, programming in a PC. It's one of the ironic twists of Compass Control that the tablet interfaces are all iOS. Uh, however, the programming is all PC. So it means you, if, uh, you know, on your PC computers where you program Compass Navigator. However, uh, if you if you're a Mac guy or gal, you can just as easily uh, get a uh, Parallels software and uh, and program that way. So you need to have the Windows software in that Mac computer. So good questions there, and I've given a few points on it. So hopefully that helps. Um, do to do to do. So some folks asking, okay, again about the CCTV security cameras, that sort of thing. Um, can I can I uh, integrate an old CCTV camera instead of like an IP camera without a new, you know, without a DVR NVR that does that? Well, uh, uh, not without the use of a third-party device. There are a few uh, very inexpensive IP streaming devices out there that uh, that are outputting in HTTP format. And uh, so you would need you would need a like a third party device like that, and then how you put that on your t uh, compass control screen is really it's very quite simple. It's it's one of our multimedia elements, and the value of that multimedia element is kind of like the web page, if you will, which might just be a HTTP colon forward slash forward slash one nine two one six eight da 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 the uh, the IP address of that streaming device, um, and then. Uh, Ah, yeah, and then somebody uh, one one final thing that wasn't really a uh, uh, a question, but instead was just uh, uh, emphasizing 
how important it is that we use the iOS device as the controller. And because of that, you do not have to buy an expensive controller in our system. That uh, and, and thanks for adding that in. The uh, these the I'll take a step back here real quick. Sorry, the MC1000 is a retail price currently six hundred and fifty dollars retail six hundred and fifty dollars traditional dealer margins apply there so it's very inexpensive the Zigbee remote control now here's what makes this pretty cool as you see we we went pretty basic pretty straightforward with this remote okay and the big we're very excited to have it actually at Key Digital because up to this point these two years that Compass Control has been integrated I'd say 60 to 70 percent of those installations have been commercial installations because in the residential space there's always a room or maybe two the home theater and the master bedroom for example where they want to have these tactile buttons and the KDZRC 300 brings us there now this has line of sight IR and also communicates to the master controller via Zigbee, which I'll describe the missing uh, link to that in just a moment. But it's pretty cool. It works as a traditional universal remote does, as you would anticipate. You know, if you want to control the volume on the TV, you would press TV and then press volume plus or volume minus, right? But what if I want to adjust my IP controllable lighting system to increment incrementally control that pressing this LSH lighting and then the volume plus or minus can increase or send the volume up or down command to an IP based control system how does that communicate not directly from the remote to the IP based system but to the MC1000 which then sends those IP control codes. What if I would like to set the lighting to 50%? Again, specify lighting here, and then press 50, enter. Right? So this is not just a standard universal remote. This can interface with IR devices via the Zigbee uh, from the MC1000 or line of sight and it can control RS-232 for example if I press security and maybe you've programmed a macro because it's basically unlimited how, how many macros you'd like to program in here if I press security and A for arm or D for disarm you can have programmed a security or a, a macro to arm and disarm the, the uh, security system in there so RS-232 TCP IP devices in addition to IR devices and, and that is all the benefit of having that hardware that Key Digital has here this is what separates a standard universal remote uh, this guy from standard universal remotes this is what separates that hardware compass control from the guys who are just an app that only work with IP controllable devices because they don't have the hardware right and so this is this is a pretty neat device out there that's very easy to program and then finally the Zigbee receiver so this is that missing link I was talking about the Zigbee remote control you press a button and this receiver antenna picks that up from up to a hundred feet away actually and in fact we've done tests in commercial business suites where we were about 200 feet away in fact so um, you know just environmental factors do uh, do uh, weigh in so when I press a button on my Zigbee remote control, this receiver antenna receives that button press, and it actually gives us a faint blue light letting you know that it was received. The MC1000 is what executes the command or commands or events. So you can program the macros on each button press, but those really are stored in the MC1000. So that's what uh, has happened here at Compass Control where when you use the iOS device for the two years that we had only iOS the master controller was essentially a relay box for the I iOS device but now that the Zigbee remote control KDZRC 300 has been released the MC1000 coming out with it has 
intelligence can store events and variables, values, and these sorts of things internally to make, uh, and, and so the master controller is much, much more powerful. Now, these three devices can be sold a la carte, the KDMC1000, KDZRC300, that's a Zigbee remote control, the KDZRX, the Zigbee receiver 200. They could be uh, sold individually, purchased individually, uh, or as a kit, KDCC kit 1000. The three items together, they're, uh, they're, they're to get, uh, their combined MSRP is $950. However, if you purchase the KDCC kit 1000, the retail is $850. So it's uh, going to save some money. And pardon the pun, but even if there is just a remote possibility that they're going to want a handheld remote in your application, then you'll want to go with the KDCC Kit 1000 rather than purchasing the items uh, individually and spending more money. And what separates this from other control systems out there, right? Because why, uh, they're, you know, look, we're, I, I just mentioned a moment ago that we're less expensive than some other competitors, but there's probably other competitors that are less expensive than us for this kind of system. But what separates this offering from all the others out there is you could surround this, you could complement this with however many iOS devices that you'd like for your system. And each iOS device just needs a single, or just needs to be activated with that license number. Now, I have a question here. Um, oh, okay, so uh, one, one, one uh, integrator here is asking how much is the license, just so they know, and I mentioned the model number, and really you should get all of your pricing information from Capital Sales, but it is a $100 retail price for the license. And then secondly, a gentleman, uh, well, same gentleman in fact, thanks very much for the good questions, sir, is asking about, well, what about CEC via HDMI? And for that, I thank you, sir, for proposing that question, and I thank you for letting me know one thing today, um, that I'm on my game so far. <laughs> I always think as a trainer, if somebody asks a question and your very next slide is going to ask that question, then you're just setting up these dominoes. Um, but yeah, so the $100 is per device, remember, so if you're going to have five uh, iOS devices, you need five licenses, and we went over, we've gone over the reasons for that, because each iOS device is its own master controller. They can all be unique um, as to their capabilities, as to the codes, as to the look and feel, and those sorts of things. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, so, so, so now, <laughs> uh, let me get to pumping up my own tire and how, how I was on it today. <laughs> um, so then the question was, well, what about CEC uh, for HDMI? And um, and we've done a pretty cool thing here. Now, are we using CEC? Yes. Are we using CEC codes? No. Now, I'll tell you guys what I mean by that here in a few moments. Um, Key Digital, for 15 years, we've been a hardware company. Second time I've said that today, a hardware company. When we released Compass Control two years ago, we said, you know what? We're doing this backwards from everybody else. Most control systems don't have hardware when they begin, right? They don't have hardware where Key Digital, if it's a multi-zone video system, we are the hub of that system. We have the infrastructure. We have the hardware already in the rack that interconnects all of these devices, all of these endpoint devices. And so just earlier this year, we did something super cool. We began building in, integrating Compass Control Master Controllers into our digital IQ series, digital video matrix switchers. KDHD 4x4 Lite is not only a 4x4 matrix, it's also a 16-port master controller. The KDHD 6x6 Lite is a 26-port master controller, and the KDHD 8x8 Lite, the big boy of the Digital IQ series, is a 32-port master controller, meaning you don't even need a secondary master controller. This is all you need and a $100 license. How do we get there? Well, first, you know, I promised myself I wouldn't talk much about video. Video, video, video. I grew up on video. I'm a video guy, but I do have to tell you about this product. 
Oh, looks like my custom animations are going to be a little bit out of whack here, so let me just go ahead and jump to all of them. Okay, first of all, this is our 4K, our 4K Ultra HD supported matrix family, the Digital IQ series. 4K, and I'm not talking about just one display. We happen to get lucky and it works 4K. We've done these in installations, real world installations with six different 4K supported displays. It was five different brands, JVC projector and JVC flat panel. You know that's not the same chipset, are the only uh, repetitive brands. Sony, Sharp, Samsung, and LG are the others. Now we've tested with even more than that in our lab. So this is our 4K supported matrix. Uh, additionally, those the all of uh, your you your you you've got HD base T output on each output, and those HD base T receive extenders, they're KDCAT HD two fifty POH RX the receiver. Those are in the box. So if you buy the four by four, six by six, eight by eight SKU, four six or eight receive extenders are in the box. And those receive extenders, they're POH powered over HD base T and that's where this secondary power connector comes in here that I'm highlighting one for the matrix the one that looks like a DIN connector and one for uh, one that powers all four six or eight receive extenders meaning you don't have to struggle to find the space for the wall wart behind the display and anytime you see from a key digital part that an output has both the RJ45 and the HDMI those are both gonna be hot simultaneously and I always thought that was something that everybody did. A lot of folks told me told me differently, though. So that's a big, big benefit. You actually have 16 available outputs here, but they're going to show the same thing at the same time if you're using both the HD base T and the HDMI from a single output. And the built-in Compass Control Master Controller, again on the 8x8 light, is a 32-port compass system. How do we get to the number 32? Ah, <clears throat> how do we get there? It's actually very, uh, very, well, you can see there's eight ports on the 8x8, what we call expansion IOs. Those are your multifunction, MCP35, IR, bidirectional RS-232, and a voltage trigger. However, however, there is one limitation here using the digital IQ series matrix uh, uh, instead of a MC1000, there is no voltage sensor. But your eight multifunction ports here, IR, bidirectional RS-232, or voltage trigger, your HD base T outputs have a stereo port on them as well. IR, bidirectional RS-232, or a voltage trigger. And then we're doing something very cool, very, very unique. The eight HDMI inputs and your eight HDMI outputs, we actually consolidate, we embed control, IR, bidirectional RS-232, even a voltage trigger onto the HDMI connector. How do you get it out? You'll use this, the IQ Jump 12 FM. There is a typo there, so if you guys are uh, right, jotting this down, that part, this little, this little HDMI dongle that we see here on the left is IQ Jump 12 FM. So IQ integrates with the digital IQ series. It's just a jumper and it's female to male with that control breakout on the cable. And in fact, just like the gentleman had asked before, we use that CEC line on the HDMI because we've never connected that in key digital video matrix switchers. You don't want CEC in a matrix system. You don't want to turn off a TV and potentially a Blu-ray player is going to turn off as well, which might be being viewed at another time in another zone. So we've never connected that in Key Digital. Instead, now we're using the CEC channel for good, not for evil, and we are embedding our control signals into those ports. Now, there's one more port here, in fact. So where we talk about 32, there's actually a bonus, 33rd port. This port right here, the DB9 connector that you've always just used to control our video matrix switcher via RS-232, now is there for your taking as a 9-pin connector, a DB9 to connect to another uh, RS-232 controllable device. So it's going to look a little something like this. Device is connected through those digital IQ jumper cables. 
They're sold in packs of four, by the way. Devices connected off of the expansion IOs, IR or RS-232. You're going to have televisions with your IR emitters or RS-232 connected to those displays out of the CAT HD 250 POHs. You may have displays with the HDMI connected and uh, break out that uh, control on the 3.5. And finally, even integrating with our other extender sets if you need extended range. HDMI in plus the control IR or RS-232 into the extender and then you HDMI out, IR or RS-232 out as well. And it's all possible because Compass is an IP based control system. Your iPad just communicates via the network into the IP port of the digital IQ matrix switcher making it the master controller. So here's the part number. And sorry for the confusion earlier. Yeah, it should be KD IQ Jump 12 FM. And, and in fact, uh, the folks at Capital Sales should have these already. And you don't have to wait for a compass system to start using these. In fact, they are super, super cool and super, super beneficial. Um, in addition to adding uh, 8, 12, and 16 ports to the light matrix switchers, have you ever had CEC problems where you turn off CEC or any net or whatever on, on your devices and still somehow you turn off a TV and, some, and the other devices turn off? That's a CEC problem. We could take care of that for you. Just plug this in on one end of your HDMI cable and just connect to that 3.5 millimeter port and CEC does not make it through. It gets routed right out of that 3.5 millimeter. What about this scenario? The customer, you have one HDMI cable run into the display. Maybe it's hung on the fireplace. The customer says, oh, I want to do this there, which means you're going to need another wire. It's impossible, right? What about putting this on both ends of your HDMI cable? and embedding the IR to come in or the RS-232 to come in and then extracting through the uh, second IQ jump on the other end. Embed and extract control, mono analog audio, digital audio, digital PCM can go there. Even stereo analog audio, well, it works, but we don't recommend it. Why not? Because we utilize the wire inside of the HDMI, which is not twisted to support, you know, twisted as an analog audio cable would be, right? So it works, but you might end up with some noise or something. <laughs> so that's how we, how we do it there, sir. And he just responded to me and said, uh, thanks. So I, I, I hope that means it made sense to everybody. So, you know, it, the reason we didn't, we're not really doing CEC right now. I mean, we're, we're using CEC. We're just not using CEC communication is because um, it's so proprietary. You know, it's really just so proprietary. So instead, we, uh, we use what people are already using over those channels, over those pipes. Okay, guys, so here's where we bring this whole thing home. Um, we've introduced you to the system and, you know, compared and contrasted even versus some co co competition. But uh, compared and contrasted, you know, uh, some of the features of our system, the IP-based system, established what Compass is and how it works. Um, we've done, we've introduced you to the software of our system without actually programming, of course, uh, how you get trained on it, though. We've gone over the hardware of the system, whether it's a standalone control system or if you have multi-zone video as well. And now my favorite part of the presentation, which is the guys who have gone through our training courses, we get to show you what they have done over the past two years when, when taking full advantage, capitalizing fully on that blank palette iOS device. And this was one of my favorites because it's a very early compass control installation. But this one right here immediately satisfied what a good GUI should, should, should satisfy. What, what am I talking about? Well, a GUI, building a GUI is like old school communication to and from a computer graphically. So 
when you communicate via hyperterminal to a device, you control the device and then you can even see how you can control the device. What is the status of the system and how can I manipulate this system are the two requirements, the two, uh, the two goals that your GUIs should aim to achieve. And this one does that. It's a video wall, 4x4 four four video wall, and these are being rolled out nationwide. Can't give too many details on that, but it is in the hospitality side of things. And initially, uh, the, uh, these systems were only controllable, this, uh, this video wall panel was only controllable via a very expensive computer system that uh, only a few, uh, you know, one of the managers of the hotel knew how to, uh, to control. And instead of rolling out, as they had initially planned, multiple thousands of these installations, there was a very big risk or very big concern from one of our partners here who makes this video wall panel that this job wasn't going to uh, ever reach more than a dozen because the control uh, offering, the, the other computer, was just too expensive. So we got involved and we uh, created the protocols to control these devices and it's, we put it on an iPad and everybody, everybody can control this thing. Whether it's the people who work in the lobby at this hotel or in the restaurant at this hotel, and, uh, depending on where it is, there sometimes these walls are installed in different places. You know, I want it in full wall mode, or if I press this button, I can put it in quadrant wall mode, and that button stays nice and blue, indicating to you the status of the system. If I want to control quadrant four, I just press this button, and that control panel there will control that source of quadrant four. Here's a cool one because this guy, he, he built a system using our, uh, that initial flagship look and feel, as you see in the back left-hand side. And then he said, you know, I got a lot of zones of audio, and I really don't want them to have to flip, uh, you know, the swipe gesture to go zone to zone to zone. So he created this page where he had, like, these tiles for the zones, and then he had the source. And it was just that simple to listen to any of those sources in any zone. But he called us up, and he said, hey, um, there's a big problem. I said, well, what do you mean? It looks great. He said, how do I control that source without sending them into the other page? So we squeezed the buttons together, and... Again, we're a support company. We started brainstorming with them. You know, we squeeze those buttons together. We put that little silver remote there. And when you press that silver remote, this whole control panel becomes visible corresponding to whatever audio source is selected. And you do what you need to do. You press your buttons. You press this corner button here. And it hides it away. Invisible means it's not selectable any longer in our software. Here's a cool one, nice big buttons for the corporate install. Nice big buttons here enables, you know, even the people at the upper uh, food chain in various corporations who usually the higher you go in the, in the pay scale and how many zeros at the end of their yearly salary uh, <laughs> uh, invertedly corresponds with how uh, how advanced or how simplistic that control system needs to be. Big buttons make everything nice and simple. In fact, this is a, our uh, this was a uh, installation that uses a Polycom bidirectional driver uh, that we have, and that Polycom driver actually automatically populates all of this favorites information. Uh, when you when you type in here to search, actually, it calls forward. It calls visible the Apple keyboard. You could type in there and populate that. Same thing here. So, and that's something that our software enables that Apple keyboard to come up. Here's a cool one. This is a uh, this is a, a, a school, a private school in the Nashville area. And this guy's been on fire ever since installing this. Why? And how? Well, because he installed this system only two years after installing a previous system for the in the same place, but it was analog video. They wanted to go Apple TV and AirPlay at the school. He said, "No problem. It means you got to go HDMI." And these guys who make that HDMI switcher have this new control system with the slider support instead of the old system, which just had 0, 25, 50, 75 type uh, volume level support. And uh, he showed it to them, and they said, and they, they realized that this compass control, 
was at least five years ahead of the other technologies these other control systems are using. Five years ahead, because those guys have been promising that stuff for five years at the time, and they still haven't delivered. All right, that's how we know that. So he installed that. It's got seven iPads in the system. The principal, the band director, uh, other faculty, as they come and go from the system, they walk right in and they collect the status for each of the uh, audio sources and zones. Are they active or unactive, muted, unmuted, latched, unlatched? And what is their level? Because there's an iOS device that lives in that network or on that rack, and as soon as the others come in, they collect the status of those shared variables. And so whether the principal leaves home for the day and then comes in in the morning, doesn't matter. That iPad is able to just collect that information right away. And he's installed now three systems at the school, including the school theater where they did some nice uh, Wizard of Oz play recently and they had tornadoes playing off of each other. It's all controlled over the compass system. And now he's uh, basically the school auditorium is like a big uh, showroom for him. Any anytime another school comes in, for a basketball game, which by the way they also control the, 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 the scorekeeper's table, anytime another school comes in, they say, what in the earth is that? We got to have that. <laughs> um, here's a cool one. This guy, you know, just a really simplistic graphic. He created 100% from scratch, and he did a really nice, a really brilliant thing, which was just made a flattened image. And he's got our buttons over top of the touchable surface of these buttons. And our button is here, but it has our button has no image property. So it's there, it's pressable, but it's really super simple to just make these it you know quote unquote invisible buttons and uh, and place them over and put the correct function on them. Here's another guy came in, did some really excellent graphic work. Kind of took our existing uh, look and feel of the demo system and tweaked it. Put the source selection in there and just made it look super, super cool. So this, is a, this one was a really nice system. Uh, really happy with the work this guy's done. And here's a, you know, not so much about the GUI, although it's kind of cool, just the remote there. But this one is super interesting because a guy came in and he heard me say that the control codes just live in the iPad. They just live in the iPad. And he said, well, what if I have these sports bars in New York City that are ready to rip their hair out or the control system because the RF is always getting interference? He said, well, yeah, if you've got DirecTV boxes, 24 of them in fact, 24, you can control those via IP typically as long as you've got the correct models, right? So what he did, he put those 24 boxes, 24 DirecTV receivers, and he just, you just put them in the system. They don't even have to connect to the master controller. Nothing is, in fact, connecting the master controller, but we need a master controller always for authentication. So there's got to be at least one. And then he did a really cool thing, which was we did a variable control for each of these buttons. What does it mean guide? Well, or what does it mean variable control? It means we need some variable to hold the value of what is the, you know, what box are we controlling? In other words, he named them numerically, 1 through 24. So if they type in here in the keypad 24, then whatever button I press next controls the box named 24. So he has like one, one remote instead of making 24 remotes. It's always correct based on what's printed out here. And he only needs one master controller even if he had added 24 more sharp or any IP controllable displays to the system. He could do that with just one master controller and a $100 license. Here's a look at our template that we've done now uh, for many of the DBX Zone Pro installations. And yes, this beer glass you see in the bottom right corner is your volume control. And this is actually one that uh, we, we in fact sell um, our programming services as well if you don't uh, think that you'll be able to learn the system in time. And uh, ever since doing uh, this first one, we've now done uh, wine glasses and whiskey bottles and all of that. So here's, uh, here's a question. 
uh, uh, about what I just said. He says, you just said we must have a master controller, but if the control is all built into the iPad and we are controlling everything via IP, then why a master controller? Well, Phil, that's a very, very uh, good question. I'll tell you two reasons. One, uh, the technical reason uh, is we looked for an, uh, a, a proper master controller to, uh, to authenticate the iPad at the beginning of starting up the system. Um, what constitutes a proper master controller? A KDMC 1000 or one of our old KDMC 2500s or any of the digital IQ matrix switchers with compass control built in. Now, why is that pot, why is that necessary? I'll tell you I'll tell you, you know, we look for that authentication, we need that there for security reasons because um, uh, you know, you might have an IP based security system that we want to ensure, you know, uh, that we need to give the end user the ultimate ability to even password protect access into uh, our, our control of a device, and we actually enable that in our app, but, uh, but it, it authenticates a master controller to do that. So, so it's for security reasons, and, and there's, an, there's a business reason as well, Phil, which is, you know, we're here as a support company with Compass Control, and, oh, I'm sorry. I, I hope you don't mind uh, me, me saying uh, names there. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, we're here as a support company. Uh, having a control system that enables the iPad to be a blank palette um, means there's going to be a lot of questions involved. And we're good with that. We like that. It, it increases everyone's investment. Um, but if we only sold a one license at $100 and somebody, uh, you know, places many, many tech support calls, then it's hard for us to be a profitable company. And so that's why there's always one piece of hardware necessary as well. And I, uh, it helps us make money, it helps you make money, it helps capital sales make money all through the way. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the business reason behind it. So here's a cool one, because this guy here was our very first integrator to control theatrical lighting, LED, DMX controllable lighting, that's right. We we do that through Compass Control. Uh, we don't have DMX inside. There is a third-party converter that we recommend, uh, RS-232 to DMX. And then you can actually mix lights, um, the red, green, blue, and white levels, or uh, depending on you know how many channels you need for your uh, system. Um, we support up to uh, four channels or four parameters in any command four variables in any command. So uh, red, green, blue, and white, or maybe address plus red, green, blue, right? Um, and uh, we've done, if you're going to go to Cedia, there's a great uh, installation. In fact, uh, we're going to have a YouTube video of this up just in time for Cedia, uh, a place called Wash Park Sports Alley, Washington Park Sports Alley in Denver. Not too close to the convention center, but if you're uh, going around town, you might want to check it out. They have a really awesome, awesome LED lighting control uh, plus video matrixing all off of the compass control system that, you know, if there's a touchdown scored by the Broncos or a goal scored by the Colorado Avalanche, you know, we, we created this macro that has uh, 20, uh, like 20 plus seconds of control in it and the integrator was able to do that all off of the iPad and it has all these different lights and then it even restores back to the uh, previous lighting colors. Uh, so if it's uh, within a Broncos game, it goes right back to the black and orange at the end of that whole thing. And that's been a really popular item, actually, that LED lighting control. Sometimes folks say, um, you know, I'd like to have a floor plan. We say, no problem. It's just an image file. Bring it in. It's a PNG image. Bring it in. We need a PNG. You can import any PNG into our software. And then we have layering, depth levels. The higher the depth level, the, the close, uh, you know, it's, it's like bring to front. And so we put these buttons on top, you press TV 1, 2, or 3, and uh, you can select a source, or if you press audio, then it uh, makes these TV buttons invisible and kind of divides up the system into the audio zones, or I guess this one looked a little bit more like this for the audio zones, um, something like that. And then here, do, 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 do. so uh, it kind of, uh, I think they uh, had a three-color overlay on that one. And this guy here was just absolutely brilliant. This guy came from uh, Edmonton, Alberta in the class, and he was already very good at what he did with the Photoshop and everything. But he said, you know what, I've got this uh, real home run client here. They're a, a franchise, so they're all over uh, Canada. 
And um, I want to roll these out. So what he did, he just went to their website and he took their branding and put it into the iPad. Because how can they argue with what they created, right? The look and feel. And, uh, you know, like I said, he was good with Photoshop. You could tell because he made some TVs that looked exactly like uh, like they should look here uh, or, or, you know, uh, according to the, the rest of the GUI and, and the images he took and the coloring and that sort of thing. But, uh, man, what a nice-looking interface. And, uh, and, uh, and he's been very, very successful rolling that out one by one since then. All right, there's been a real good amount of questions already which I am all for. Um, but now we'll open it up if you guys have any more. We're happy to uh, answer those. Also, um, this video is being recorded. And uh, as long as there's no problems in the rendering process, we should be able to get that video over to Capital Sales. So if you want to review some of this, <clears throat> um, we'll go ahead and uh, give you guys 60 seconds to uh, submit any questions via the uh, questions panel in the GoToMeetings control panel. And uh, go ahead and uh, send them on over, folks. Look forward to receiving those. And if you're uh, wanting to, uh, instead, uh, needing to be on the road here, that's just fine. I'm going to go ahead and advance to the next slide, which contains my contact information. I'd love to hear from you and get your thoughts on Compass Control and get some feedback on the training. Thanks so much for doing this, guys, and uh, I'll sit tight for 20 more or 60 more seconds here to get some questions and read them aloud to the class because they may be thinking the same thing you are. Okay, guys, well, um, I see a few of you guys have started slipping out, and in fact, there's not really any questions here. So with that being said, please, 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 please come on through to booth 420 at Cedia in Denver, Colorado. We'd love to see you. Let me know that you are on the webinar. I'll be at the booth. I'm also doing a training on Wednesday where the show starts Thursday. So if you're getting in a day early, we have that there. And uh, it's on our website, the information about registration and whatnot. We'd love to see you guys there at booth 420 in Denver, Colorado. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for, again to the folks at Capital Sales. And we look forward to hearing from you and working with you. Take care, everybody.